Last Sunday, we finished a series that we had been in for several weeks called Level Up. Uh, many of you renamed the series Flow, and that works too. I like that. And today, I don't know if we're going to start a new series, I just, uh, but I had a message on my heart, and I realized I can't teach this message until I back up and teach the one I'm going to teach today. So I had my message all prepared, and then I was like, oh, I need to back up a step and build a foundation for next week's message. So today, um, we're going to talk about identity theft. How many of that's exactly what the enemy wants to steal from you? Because if he can steal your identity, then he can take everything from you. But it's your identity in Christ that gives you access to all the riches in glory. Because what does the Bible say? My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So if you don't know who you are in Christ, who Christ is in you, then you are alienated from all the promises of God. And all the promises of God are yes and amen, so be it. So aren't you glad that all the promises of God, that verse could read differently? And I think some Christians think it reads differently. They think it says all the promises of God are you never know. <laughs> or maybe. No, but they are yes and amen. So be it. So 1 John 4, 17 says at the end of that verse, it says, As Jesus is, so are we in this world. Now, let's quick survey. Have you ever read the Bible and you're like, man, that just doesn't make any sense? Am I the only one? You're like, okay, who begat who? And, you know, you, you got all these, you have these poems and prophecies and parables. But I want to point out that there's a thread that travels through the Bible from beginning to end or from end to beginning that connects all the Scripture together because God painted in the Scripture a, poit a portrait of His Son, Jesus. And so I had a Bible college professor who used to say, speaking of the Old and the New Testament, he would say, in the Old, the New concealed, and in the New, the Old revealed. In other words... You're going to get a lot more out of your Bible when you read it if you're looking for Jesus. He's the central character of Scripture. The Bible is really about the first Adam and the second Adam. It's about two men, Adam in the garden and Jesus in the garden. It's about those two gardens and those two men. It's about two women. It's about Eve, and it's about the bride of Christ. And I don't know if you knew it or not, but that's you. So you cannot understand Leviticus without the book of Hebrews. And you can't understand the book of Daniel without the book of Revelation. And you can't understand the Passover without Exodus 12. And you can't understand Isaiah 53 without the gospel accounts of the crucifixion and the resurrection. And so the value of the study of the types and the anti-types or the, the types and the shadows... Uh, is, is, is the, the proof that they furnish that the Bible was written by one author. Many writers, but one author, and that author is the Holy Spirit. That's a whole other sermon for another Sunday. But, uh, and there is one subject, and that's God's Son and, and His bride, the church. So let me say it to you this way, because this is just, I'm laying a foundation for what we're going to talk about next week. But the Old Testament is like God's selfie. He's like saying, I want to give you a snapshot of myself. And that's why you have all these symbols in the Old Testament. Then you get to the New Testament, and it's like, ta-da, here I am. And so, and literally, I am. So here I, I am. And that is Jesus. So, um, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. And if you're not taking notes, I'd love for you to write this down. The life that Jesus lived qualified him for the death that he died. And the death that he died qualifies us for the life that he lived. Oh, man. I don't know if you realize how good that was. Let me say it one more time. The life that Jesus lived qualified him for the death that he died, and the death that he died qualifies us for the life that he lived. 
There was an atheist named John Paul Sartre, and on his deathbed, he said, my life is unlivable as an atheist. Then Nietzsche, who's the one who famously said, God is dead. He also lived the last 12 years of his life clinically insane. And um, so there was... <laughs> so God probably has a sign in heaven that says, Nietzsche is dead. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Every religion offers lessons. But only Jesus offers life. He said, I am come that you may have, not a really good lesson so that you're smarter, but I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So we see that Joseph in the Old Testament is a type and a shadow of Jesus in the New Testament. In other words, he's not Jesus, but he's pointing to, representing. Do you remember Jesus, uh, Joseph had the coat of many colors? Remember his brothers betrayed him and threw him into a pit? Sound familiar? Judas betrayed Jesus. Uh, and someone said, well, your analogy breaks down because uh, uh, Joseph's brothers sold him for 20 pieces of silver, but Judas sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And my first thought, well, that's easy. That's called inflation. <laughs> Look around. So we see Joseph as a type of Christ. We see in the book of Song of Solomon uh, is about a bride and a groom. It's kind of saucy, so you know, if, if you're not married, you might not want to read it just yet. But uh, we see Noah's ark is a type and a shadow of Jesus. So all throughout the Old Testament, uh, we see types and shadows of Christ. So how is the ark of Noah, how does a boat represent Jesus? Well, the judgment of God was coming, so everyone who went inside the boat was saved. Eight souls went in there, and eight's the number of eternity. And so the judgment came and wiped away all the wicked, and, and that same judgment lifted the ark up into the heavens. Uh, we know over 30,000 feet because it covered the highest peak. And, uh, and then when the ark came back down to the earth, the door was opened, and out from the side of the ark stepped those eight into a brand new world that was uh, pure or cleansed of evil. And so uh, we see that when the, the judgment of God was poured out on Jesus, but those that are in Christ Jesus are saved. Jesus was pierced in his side, so out of the side of Jesus came the bride of Christ. And when you are, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. You're, you got a whole new world. And the things that used to dominate you don't dominate you anymore. So we could go on and on and on about the types and the shadows of Christ in the Old Testament. We have the Passover lamb in Exodus 12 that represents Jesus. When they put the blood on the doorpost of the house, the death angel passed over. And how many when you have the blood of Jesus on the doorpost of your life, that death passes over? And so that we could go on and on and on, but I want you to see that uh, you know, the serpent on the pole. I keep thinking of him. as like, the serpent on the pole. Moses lifted up the serpent on the pole, and everyone who looked at the serpent lived because that, that, they had been bitten by the venomous snakes. But when they looked at that serpent on the, the bronze serpent on the pole, and the Bible says in John chapter 3 and verse 14, 15, and 16, I know you know those verses, for God so loved the world that he gave. But before it says that, it says, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the serpent on a pole, if I be lifted up, Whosoever believes in me. So Jesus likened himself unto the serpent on a pole. You would think, why is he a bronze? Bronze represents judgment. Why would he be a bronze snake and not a golden lamb? Because God poured, he made Jesus to be sin with our sin. And all the judgment of God landed on Jesus. But if you'll look at Jesus, those that have been bitten by the serpent of sin... Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Now, that doesn't mean that they'll come and they'll worship Jesus. It's like, draw. he said, I'll draw the venom of sin and death out of you, and I'll draw all men's sin and death unto myself. And so we see all these photographs of Jesus in the Old Testament. And then we see in the New Testament, we see prophecies of his, his, his imminent return. And by the way, the rapture doesn't have any signs, but the second coming has lots of signs. So, and there's lots of signs about the second coming right now. 
that means that the rapture, if you believe in it, is even sooner or closer. And I do believe in it. You say, well, I don't believe in it. Well, that's fine. Stay here. <laughs> well, what if you're wrong? Well, you know what? If I'm wrong and we go through the tribulation, that my Bible says, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world, and no weapon formed against me will prosper. So if the church is on the earth, how many of the word still works? And I don't think that there can be a tribulation until the church is taken out of the way because we're too strong. We got too much of the presence of God in us and on us. So, because of Noah's sacrifice, God said, I will never flood the earth again. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, God said, I'm not going to be angry with man again. We could go on and on and on. So let's look at 1 Peter 1.18. 1 Peter 1.18. I want to talk about the blood of Jesus today. Because you don't know who you are in Christ until you get a revelation and a working knowledge of the blood of Jesus. 1 Peter 1.18 says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the traditions of your fathers, but you were redeemed with the what? Precious blood of Christ. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Acts 20, 28 says, Acts 20, 28, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among you which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the flock, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Oh, man. I mean, there's lots of good blood songs. Uh, I don't know why this one just came to mind. Uh, well, I know it was the blood. Remember that one? Well, I know it was the blood. Well, I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, Jesus died upon the cross. Well, I know it was the blood for me. Oh, man, you can, you can hear the bass player, can't you? Well, I know it was. Oh, man, where's everybody at? We, we can do that, man. We can do that. <laughs> and then we've got, um, <clears throat> there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And when sinners plunge beneath that flood, they lose all their guilty stains. Woo, hallelujah. They lose all their guilty stains. They lose all their guilty stains. When sinners plunge beneath that flood, they lose all their guilty stains. How many glad you lost your guilty stains? Wow. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing Woo! but the blood. Mm. Thank God for the blood. And that blood is different than any other blood because Jesus' blood is sinless blood. Not the blood of goats and bulls and not even the blood of angels. That wasn't good enough to redeem you and me. It had to be the blood of God himself. God who became a man. He became like us so that we could become like him. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sanctified. Colossians 1, 12 says, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, 
the forgiveness of sin. Now, that word forgiveness is actually the word remission. In the Old Testament, you could get forgiveness, but you couldn't get remission until Jesus came and shed his blood. So here's what I want you to know is that your identity is in Christ Jesus, so never let your struggle become your identity. Well, I'm just an alcoholic Christian. No, alcoholic might be your struggle, but that's not your identity. As long as you identify with the struggle, that will be your identity. But our identity is in Christ Jesus. Well, I'm a homosexual Christian, or I'm a lying Christian, or I'm a whoremongering Christian, or I'm a cheating on my taxes Christian. I'm a gossiping Christian. No, 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 no. You've got to identify with the victorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how you walk through this life in victory, not as a victim. Because as long as you identify with your struggle, beloved, you are the victim. But Jesus didn't come to make you a victim. He came to make you a victor. You're not overcome. You're the overcomer. But you have to identify in Christ Jesus, well, how do I do that? You got to plead the blood. How many of you in old days, man, the old saints, they would plead the blood of Jesus? Man, I remember my grandma, she'd sling blood everywhere. I plead the blood of Jesus on my kids. I plead the blood of Jesus on my grandkids. I plead the, man, if something's wrong with the car, I plead the blood of Jesus on this car. she plead the blood of Jesus on everything. I remember as a kid thinking, what is she doing? You know, in the Old Testament, they would make animal sacrifices, and then they would take that blood, and they would sling it on the altar, and they'd sling it on the people. Why? Because slinging blood was, a, was part of their worship. It was part of how they blessed and how they sanctified. But how many know we, we, that we can appropriate the blood of Jesus? We don't treat it as a common thing. It's a sacred thing. And in fact, if you say, uh, you plead, how do you, how do you plead? You say, I plead the blood. In other words, I rest my case on the blood of Jesus. I don't rest my case on my own conduct. I don't rest my case on my, my, uh, my family's past or heritage. Now, if you're like me, you come from a long line of sinners. But I, 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 I'm in a new family now. And so I plead the blood. I plead my case based on the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I'm not even an African American Christian or a Euro American Christian or a Native American Christian. I'm just a blood bought child of the Most High God. That's how I identify. Everybody today, they want to talk about how they identify. I identify as a this or a that. But listen, when you've been born again, you identify as Christ Jesus. That's your identity. A son, a daughter of the Most High God. Hallelujah. Woo! Glory to God. Nothing more, nothing less than Jesus Christ and His righteousness. So the work of redemption that God accomplished in Christ, is it far exceeds any damage that had happened in Adam's fall. <laughs> in other words, there's nothing that has happened to any of you that's greater than what Jesus suffered for you. Well, I know it was the blood. Woo! You can always just go back to that. So what Jesus did for me, let me say it again, is far greater than anything that has ever happened to me. What God wanted to do for every man, he did it in the man, Christ Jesus. Now we have to appropriate that. So you could get forgiveness in the Old Testament, but remission is in the New Testament because it's a better covenant established on better promises let me read to you hebrews chapter uh, chapter 10 and verse 17 it says uh, hebrews 10 17 and he jesus then goes on to say and their sins and their law breaking i will remember no more anybody else super glad about that <laughs> now where there is absolute remission not partial remission absolute remission 
Forgiveness and cancellation of the penalty is what that means. Where there's absolute remission, the Amplified says, where there's absolute remission and forgiveness and cancellation of the penalty of these sins and law-breaking, there is no longer any offering made to atone for sin. Therefore, brethren, since we have full freedom and confidence to enter into the Holy of Holies by the power and the virtue of the blood of Jesus. Mm. We have, uh, listen, we have freedom, full freedom and confidence by the power and virtue of the blood of Jesus to enter in to the Holy of Holies. Praise God. Uh, so my wife, Adrian was the bone marrow donor for her younger brother, Heath. Uh, he had leukemia uh, about 30 years ago or so. And, um, and so she was uh, a match. And so she became the donor. And um, now it was a very painful process for her. It was painful for her to give it, but it was easy for him to receive it. She had to go into surgery and they drilled into her bones and pulled out her bone marrow. They had to knock her out. But they gave him the new stem cells and the new bone marrow in an IV while he was sitting there playing video games. So how many know what was painful for God to give is easy for you and I to receive? And when they rolled Adrian's blood into that IV drip and they set it there and they put it and they began to put it into his body that was precious blood there was life in that blood and because of that blood and because of that bone marrow it actually caused her brother to become a brand new person in fact if they DNA tested him today he would DNA test as Adrian He's got her DNA in his body because her, they killed all his bone marrow and they gave him hers. And so if he committed a crime, Adrian could be convicted. <laughs> so she gave him a precious gift and she's really interested in him behaving right. Come on now, this will preach. How many know Jesus gave you a precious gift and he's really interested in you behaving right? But here's what I want you to know that They've, they've observed that when someone receives a bone marrow transplant, that it's, it cha literally changes their DNA. It can change their hair color. It can change their eye color. It can even change their personality. It can change what they like and what they don't like. And so when you, became, if, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he or she is a what? A new creature. How many know because of what Jesus did for you, it can change what you like and what you don't like. You don't like the things you used to like. You like what Jesus likes. Changes your desires. Changes your appetites. Hallelujah. Changes your identity. He would now test as a, as a different person. Well, this is powerful. So there's two different kinds of remission. The first is where there's no current evidence that he had cancer. But then the second one is called molecular or absolute remission where there's no evidence that cancer was even ever there. I want you to know that Jesus gave us absolute remission from sin. There's no evidence that there was ever even any sin there. That's why the Bible says that you can now come boldly before the throne of God, the throne of grace. God sits on a throne of grace. Hallelujah. Woo! Man, I'm preaching myself happy today. <laughs> so this transplant, it can change your skin, your hair, your eyes, your personality. It makes you a different person. Literally, new DNA. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I, I, I don't ever tease him, but I think about it from time to time, my brother-in-law, that uh, he's got female bone marrow. And the reason I don't tease him about it is because he's about 6'2", and he's got a big handlebar mustache, and he's obviously all man. But, uh, but I just thought it was funny. I think it's funny. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, and all things are become new. So God found a donor that was a perfect match for you. 
and his name is Christ Jesus, and everything has passed away you, you, because you've accepted what his finished work, you don't even exist anymore. I've heard where doctors have stood by uh, bedsides where someone was about to receive a bone marrow transplant, and they said, well, we're here to say goodbye to you because you won't exist anymore after this. You're going to be a brand new person. Well, how, many of that's, how much more is that a reality for us in Christ Jesus? The old person doesn't exist anymore. You now test positive as Jesus. <laughs> you don't exist anymore. It's even changed what you like and what you don't like. And God, he was, he's given you absolute remission. No evidence that there was ever a sin issue in your life. Hallelujah. Let's look at a couple more scriptures today. Uh, Romans 3.25. You get anything out of this today? Yes. Romans 3.25 says, Whom God set forth as a mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus so here's two things about that verse I want you to see number one if you'll write these down faith must have accurate knowledge of what Christ has done for you faith must have accurate knowledge of what Christ has done for you so you were engrafted into Christ Jesus so your homework assignment is I want you to go through the epistles those are not the apostles wives those are letters that the apostles wrote uh, and to the church I want you to go through the epistles and I want you to find where everywhere it says in him in Christ in whom because those are realities about you now who you are in Christ we actually have a little booklet I don't I'm looking back there at Carol I don't know if we how many we have but there's a little blue and white book called in him and if we have any of those, you're, you're welcome to take one home until they run out. All right, the second thing I want you to see is that faith must have application of what Christ has done for you. So number one, faith must have accurate knowledge of what Christ has done for you. But number two, faith must have application of what Christ has done for you. In other words, you got to apply it. I mean, let me say it to you this way. There's no such thing as silent faith. Faith is voice activated. Faith talks. So make sure what you say agrees and lines up with what he say. So that's why we say uh, in Romans chapter you know, 8, 9, and 10, it says, or chapter 10 actually, it says Romans chapter 10, verses 8, 9, and 10. It says that, what does it say? The word of faith that we preach, that it's in your heart and in your mouth, that if we believe in our heart, God raised Jesus from the dead. And if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Now, that passage is important because it shows you that faith has to be in two places. You have to believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. So you have to have accurate knowledge of what Christ has done for you. And then faith has to have application. Number two, you have to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You have to declare the lordship of Jesus over every area of your life. Or like my grandma, you got to sling the blood. I plead the blood. I rest my case on the blood of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. So when you rejoice and when you praise and when you dance and when you shout, what are you doing? There's a transaction going on in the spirit. You are applying. There's that application of the blood of Jesus. Now you identify with him in his death, but you also identify with him in his resurrection. I know Jesus didn't just die for your sins. He was raised again. He didn't just die for you. He died as you. And he wasn't just raised for you, he was raised as you. So when he died for your sin, you died for your sin. But when he was raised from the dead, you were raised from the dead. That's why we confess the lordship of Jesus, because there's a spiritual resurrection that goes on on the inside, the life of God. 
goes on the inside of you and quickens you, makes you alive where you were once dead. So you were there at his death. Did you know that you were there at the death of Jesus? You were present. You were represented, in other words. But you were also represented. You were there when he was raised from the dead. Hallelujah. For one of the first verses I ever memorized was Galatians 2.20. And it, let's see if I can remember it. <laughs> oh, thank you. They put it on the screen for me. So I have been, I just needed to get started. I have been, everybody say have been. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, what? I live. But it's not me. It's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Hallelujah. I like what one translation says. It roughly, it says something like this. It says, uh, I died and the, uh, now Jesus uh, Jesus is living his life through my body. <laughs> Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, you got this. You got this. <laughs> so when somebody says, who do you think you are? You say, well, how much time you got? <laughs> I have been identified as Christ Jesus, actually. Philippians 3, 8 says, and this will probably be the last verse we read today. Philippians 3, 8 says, through verse 11, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I might gain Christ, and be found in Him. There's one of those phrases, I just gave you one. And be found in Him through faith in Christ. You see the in him and the in Christ phrase? The righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may arrive at the resurrection from the dead, and the Amplified says, even while still in the body. Hallelujah. So God is is the light and prosperity is the shadow make sure you're always chasing the light and not the shadow God is the light and healing is the shadow if you face the light the shadow will follow you but if you turn your back on the light and chase the shadow you'll never catch it so we're not pursuing prosperity and healing and all these wonderful benefits. We're pursuing the light. We're pursuing God himself. And all these blessings are chasing us down. So we turn to Jesus. And surely goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life. Amen. So one last illustration. I told you that God painted a portrait of his son Jesus in scripture. There's a story of a wealthy man and he had a son and the son of the wealthy man uh, owned a tremendous art gallery filled with priceless paintings and the son of the wealthy man he would often go and uh, when he would go down and into the streets or what have you he would talk to this certain homeless man they kind of struck up a relationship and the son was an artist, and the homeless man, he goes, I'm, I'm an artist also. He goes, oh, well, paint, you know, paint me something. And so he painted a portrait of the wealthy man's son, and he gave it to the wealthy man's son as a gift. Well, as it happened, um, the son unexpectedly passed away. And the father, he said that uh, the son's art gallery was going to be auctioned off and so art aficionados from all over the world came because there were Picassos and Monets and all these priceless works of art and the beggar came the homeless man came and he wondered if in the son's art collection if he would see his portrait of the son that he painted and as he came in sure enough in the midst of all these priceless paintings was a small little portrait that he had painted of his friend the wealthy man's son 
So everyone was waiting for the auction to commence, and the auctioneer opened an envelope, and he says, according to the will, um, the, uh, the first piece to be auctioned off is this one, and it was the homeless man's little painting. So no one bid on it, so the homeless man, he offered a, a few coins that he had. No one else made any bids, and so he won back his painting that he had painted of his friend. And then a second envelope was handed to the auctioneer. He opened it and he read it and he says, The will states um, that uh, there was one further expression. Whoever bids on or whoever gets the portrait of the son also gets the entire collection. <laughs> he threw down his gavel and he says, The auction's over. Now suddenly this beggar, this homeless man, was instantaneously wealthy beyond his wildest dreams. He had, I mean, just one work of art was worth, you know, hundreds of millions. And so, how many know my point in the story is that if you get the son, you get everything. If you get Jesus, you get everything. You get all the blessings. All the promises of God are yes and amen. So here's my question today is... Uh, do you have the son? Do you have the son? So, as you know, we never like to close our services without giving people the opportunity to get the son, to meet Jesus. The whole book's about him. God sent his only son because he loved the world so much. And whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So would you mind just bowing your head with me today and let's pray. If you're here and you would say, I want the Son. I want the Son. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Those of you worshiping with us online today, you can make Jesus your Lord right there where you are. Come on, join us right now in saying the prayer of salvation. If that's you online, would you just type down in the comments and say, that's me. And just join us in this prayer right now. If you're in the room and you say, I want to make Jesus my Lord, will you just raise your hand real quick? Let me see who I'm praying with today. Awesome. God bless you. One, two, three, four. God bless you. Five. Awesome. Awesome. Six. I love it. Come on, everybody. Let's pray right now. Let's all pray with these half dozen folks that raised their hand and those online. And the reason we're all praying with them is because we want them to feel, instantly feel the support of their new family, the people of God. Come on, let's pray right now. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I repent of my sin. And I call on Jesus, who died for my sin. And they buried him. But on the third day, God, you raised him from the dead. And so I say, Jesus, you are my Lord. From this moment forward, I have the Son. <laughs> and the Son has me. Now, Jesus, fill me with your spirit and give me power to live this new life and to be a witness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. There's a party going on in heaven for you. All the angels are shouting and rejoicing. In heaven, today is your birthday, your spiritual birthday. So happy birthday prayed that prayer, uh, we would like to just help you take your next step. So there's a, they're going to put a QR code on the screen, and then if you'll just go to the uh, outside, there's a uh, the Welcome Center, and then we'll be happy to give you a little booklet and some things just to help you take your next step, because that's why we're here, is just to, to help guide you all along on the path of your journey. So welcome to the family of God. We're super glad about uh, the step that you, you just made. And remember, if you're a guest with us today, be sure and uh, fill out a Connect card, go by the Welcome Center, get your Cinnabon uh, gift card, and uh, we want to um, just bless you with that. Thank you for uh, worshiping with us today. Wednesday night at 6 o'clock is prayer. And uh, would you mind standing up? Let me just speak a blessing over you today. Hallelujah. Father, I plead the blood of Jesus over these today. And I thank you that they are washed in the blood, forgiven by the blood, cleansed by the blood, justified and righteous because of the blood of Jesus. And everywhere they go, 
They are a light in the darkness in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, can you say amen? Amen. We love you. Have an awesome rest of your Sunday. We'll see you Wednesday night at prayer. You're dismissed.